Christopher never hurt anybody. He had a gentle, loving, and giving heart. And they crucified him in those woods. And they humiliated his little body. They took his little manhood before he even knew what it was. And I hate him for it. I can't imagine what was going through Michael's mind. You know, was he calling for me? How long did they leave him there tied up on that ditch bank before they decided to kill him? I mean, what were they doing to him? Was he, was he conscious or unconscious? Did he watch the other two boys get cut? He was really being killed by real monsters. Hello, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler. And with me today in the studio is... Is Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst, author, advocate, and director and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I am the casting director for Criminal Minds, and I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. Well, today is our next installment on the Paradise Lost series. We're talking about the child murders of Robin Hood Hills. Three eight-year-old boys were found brutally murdered, tied, and dumped in a stream in a wooded area in West Memphis, Arkansas. We're in the middle of analyzing the crime scene and the investigation. Laura. One thing I'd like to ask you is apparently these boys were hogtied, but in a very unusual way. In other words, hog tying is usually where the ankles are bound, the wrists are bound, and then the wrists and the ankles are bound together. In this case, it appeared that the left hand was bound to the left leg and the right hand was bound to the right leg. Have you ever seen that before in a, uh, in a crime scene like this? Well, I mean, certainly to caveat it, I haven't been exposed to or been involved in as many of Mm -hmm. these types of cases, you know, children in in particular, as you have, um, Jim C. And certainly in those that I have seen, I haven't seen that before or heard of that. Um, And I think it was interesting, you know, all the way through it was described as hog tying. And of course, you know, the way that you described it the first time, that's what it it would conjure up in your mind. But this is quite different. And of course, what was used is another important part um, to this case, it being shoelaces that right. were actually the boys, you know, and of course the first question that you ask, if knowing that it's shoelaces, were well, whose? I mean, right. were the boys' trainers were recovered, were the laces present or were they not? And of course right. we find out that it was their own shoelaces, bar yeah. one, that was yeah. used. So one of them was from another pair of shoes, but the rest were their shoelaces. And... Again, that is an indicator of impulsive, uh, disorganized offender. Somebody who didn't plan this event but used tools that he found strapped up together at the crime scene. That were available to him. Right. And so it's interesting. Um, And what, what I'm left with, though, is it's a very ineffective way to keep somebody controlled. Because if one hand is tied to a foot behind the back, if each hand is tied to the foot on that side of the body, then it seems like it would be easy for them to bring it around the front. You know, by bending over, bring the bindings around to the front, and then just untie them. And like a wiggling child, I can't imagine, especially with a little shoelace, to be able to do that, you know, and... and So it... It, to me, it seems like they could have been put on after the child was already incapacitated. And Certainly. I mean, that's an, that's an interesting point. And, of course, we've seen it in other cases, too, where we talk about the sort of the authenticity of some of the things that we see at the crime scene and whether it's staged or, you know, what what purpose does it serve? And I think what's interesting in this case in particular is that two of the boys did have defensive wounds and did appear to have fought back and they did have contusions and abrasions around, you know, their wrists and their legs where they were tied. And I believe that was um, Stevie and Michael. 
but yet Chris Byers didn't have that any sort of bruising or contusions. And so it was opined that he was probably unconscious at the point that those restraints were placed on him, the shoelaces. Right. But, of course, the other two, it looks like there was some form of, you know, they did have defensive wounds on their hands that they were trying to fight back. But, of course, a sequence of injuries, they, they all sustained um, multiple skull fractures. So, you know, which part came first? Probably the beatings, which, you know, we need to talk about the specific documented injuries. Right. So in the, the first two hours, we hear a lot about the so-called injuries but quite a lot of that is actually inaccurate in terms of what the boys sustained. And then some of the other things that are talked about, it comes down to somebody's interpretation of how those injuries got there. Right. And I think that's what's critically important here is to keep it to what actually happened. And as we've done in other cases, kind of drill down behind the scenes and, and talk about what the actual injuries were. So the opening shot that we've already talked about is a little bit misleading because it, it looks like the boys were found on the banks of the creek when indeed, as you find out later, they were actually submerged um, and they were naked. I mean, what, just right off the jump, what does that say? Well, first, I mean, first of all, before we get there, because mm -hmm. you just brought up a point, um, actually, if you look at the crime scene photos, I believe that what they did was they stacked, um, they stacked sandbags in uh, the creek and blocked the water, made a dam, and then uh, pumped out um, the water so that they could leave. I think the first boy was probably taken out and put, on the bank, put on the bank, and I think the other two were actually in situ there. Um, I'm not positive, but I, when I, I looked at it over and over again, and, and I, can't, um, I can't make sense out of the wall of sandbags other than that. And so I think they drained the area where the bodies were actually found. Um, and, and that way they could actually see what the situation was. And I believe one of the boys was, uh, his body, his shirt was basically used to sort of almost tie him down with a, uh, with almost like, a, they said it's a stick, but it's really, you know, sort of thick. And it's more like a log that's jammed into the, the base of the, uh, of the stream. Uh, and that, to me, that was meant to keep him in place so that they either didn't float up or didn't float downstream and get discovered. So somebody made a pretty significant effort and a successful effort to a large extent at conceal, concealing these bodies and the bicycles. And so they spent some time, effort, and energy doing that. And that's an important factor that we're going to look at, and, and later it will weigh heavily in our assessment. But the boys weren't weighted down by rocks or anything to really keep. I mean, that's the thing that kind of stuck with me. Like, if you were really going to hide them in this creek, you know, wouldn't you put things? If you were a sophisticated criminal and you knew that after a certain amount of time that the bodies would float and float, um, then you would do that. But this is not, there's no evidence of a sophisticated criminal in this case. Um, I think the criminal sophistication was very low. Um, I think... There is indicators of anger and uh, rage and... Uh, but it's impulse rather than assault. something that's planned right. and targeted and they spent a lot of time thinking about it. So, And of course the window of time becomes critical for the perpetrator um, or perpetrators. You know, the more time that they are missing whilst the boys are missing, um, you know, will raise alarm bells and question marks. So I think, you know, we'll get more into that in terms of the the actual um, crime scene behaviours. But I think, you know, for me, the, the, the very first question I was starting to, to think about, well, what is the actual cause of death? Um, because that wasn't clear at all. Um, and I had actually had to search for this. Yeah, um, they, they don't make it very clear in this. Right, because, um, well, the documentary was focusing on... Um, basically emotional interpretations that people made. Um, and in my opinion, those interpretations were not made by people who had the, the training and experience to make those interpretations. So why don't you go into what the actual listed cause of death was for all these boys? Yeah, so this took some time to find. And um, certainly Michael Moore was listed on the autopsy that he 
had multiple injuries um, and was drowned, but it was he had multiple skull fractures and it was the drowning as well. So it was a, a brutal beating um, in terms of him and that's what killed him as, along with drowning. Stevie Branch was the same, multiple injuries and, and drowning and he had multiple skull fractures. And Chris Briers, it was listed that he had multiple injuries but he bled to death. So... There were lots of other marks on them and they were listed too, although some of them uh, came down to sort of interpretation and uh, listed on the autopsy report, it said, you know, a lot around different marks and gouging and abrasions and scratching um, and bite marks. But actually, when you look further at the bite marks, it's listed in terms of, you know, internal to one of the boy's mouths and to his tongue that he was biting his own, you know, the inside of his cheeks and, and tongue. Right. And, and that could have come from being beaten in the face. And it could also come from, uh, you know, a seizure close to death. Uh, but uh, I don't think that those internal, you know, interior to his own mouth bite marks are as significant as all the other actual artifacts of the what actually caused his death. In other words, the skull fractures, the bleeding to death. Was there anything in the autopsy about where the source of the bleeding was? Was it stab wounds or was it the skull fractures, do they say? So no, it's not, it's not actually listed in the autopsy. It just says multiple injuries, brackets, bled to death. Yeah. Because I know there's a lot of in in these in these uh, documentaries, there's a lot of talk about knives, and uh, but I, in my reading of the case and my recollection, which isn't perfect on this case, it was quite a while ago, but that there was no actual stab wounds. Am I right? Yeah, no actual stab wounds I'm on the on the scalp um, for Chris Briers. It says that there was a, a laceration. Um, reflection of scalp showed hemorrhage and soft tissue underlying lacer laceration. But it doesn't, I mean, it really just kind of generalizes of lacerations, abrasions, um, very non specific, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's really unfortunate. And that just tells you that the medical examiner that did these autopsies was not very sophisticated, nor was he very experienced in doing homicide autopsies. Unfortunately, when you're in a small town, that's yeah. pretty much what you get. You get a small town medical examiner or coroner um, who may have just been a local doctor um, who's performing the services of the coroner. But this is um, unfortunately so nebulous that it's very difficult to make uh, very determinative conclusions based on that kind of generalized information. Yeah, I was surprised to see to when I further into the documentary, you realize that they had drowned because, and uh, forgive me, this is very graphic, but when um, they're taken out of the water, they're not, they aren't blown up the way that I've seen other Bloated. people That's who, just because been, it takes time, yeah. How long would you have to be in the water before that would? Um, a number of days. A number of days, yeah. okay. Yeah. And the other thing I noticed um, is some of the boys that were on the bank, they looked like they were still in rigor. Like the, Their arms looked very stiff and out front like this how what is the process of the body going through that because that tells yeah. you how when they were killed and what you well know. Uh, that would be something the autopsy would have to have determined but um because it changes based on the body temperature and the fact that they were in water i mean all those details uh the, the external temperature um it's just yeah. impo it, it's not the same with our, every case but um, rigor sets and then it releases. Yeah, and the other thing about know. the cause of death, Laura was saying that they were maybe blunt force trauma. I guess is basically what yeah. killed them. But Absolutely. if you look at blunt force trauma, if you look, look at the pictures, they look pristine. If you didn't know this child was dead, he looks uh, Stevie Branch just looks like he's sleeping. He looks absolutely almost untouched. It's so heartbreaking. You know that is the other thing about this is is you can't quite understand what happened based on the pictures that I've seen. Right, but um, I think the although the multiple um, skull fractures and the contusions 
uh, the lacerations could also be the laceration to the skull could also be from blunt force trauma. Um, I think although those are present in all three boys, two out of three boys drown, and um, that means that they weren't killed ultimately, even if they were fatal wounds to the, sc- to the skull, that they weren't yet dead. Now, that said, I don't know how sophisticated this autopsy was because there is agonal breathing that occurs um, at or near the time of death that could come after brain death. Did you say agonal breathing? Agonal breathing. It's sort of um, breathing. It's the last reflexive type of breathing that happens sometimes. And, um, but the, the, as Laura said, the, the heart can still pump a little bit and breathing can still happen a little bit after brain death occurs. And so that can leave artifacts that make it appear that they were drowned even though they were, they were already sustained fatal head wounds. Now, if they had sustained fatal head wounds, um, it could take a long time for the brain to swell enough in order for that to actually kill them. But they may have been completely incapacitated and unconscious when they were thrown in the water, but still yet capable of breathing. So um, those are all things that need to be actually minutely uh, determined. And the nuances, uh, I just don't know that 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 information is contained in this particular autopsy report. Certainly not the one that I've seen and, and I'm referencing. And just to give you an idea, um, it certainly says has things included on it, like hydration is as one heading. And in the table, it's listed for each of them as having, each of the boys having wash a woman wrinkling, which obviously is talking about the skin condition, right. but I've certainly not seen that ever referenced before. You know, it, it just strikes me that this is somebody trying to do their best with something that they've never mm. been exposed to before and the way that it's been documented. It, it, all of the injuries that are listed, it, it's just, you know, so vague that it's very difficult to get that sense. There's certainly nothing about how much, you know, water is in the, the lungs. They didn't even measure it. Wow. But it's not, record, it's not recorded here, and that's... Yeah. Um, the the challenge with it, so you know and that means a sequence of events it's, and the sequencing of the injuries is just almost impossible. And of course, you know we're getting to some of the medical evidence as well of what's presented in court because I found that fascinating of just the questions that were asked of Dr. Peretti and just some of his answers. Yeah, I was left me absolutely dumbfounded in parts. So Jim, what are you doing June 9th, tenth, and eleventh? I, like everybody else who's into crime, I'm going to be at CrimeCon. CrimeCon 2017 is Comic-Con for crime. Mm. Real Crime Profile will be there. We will be doing a live podcast from CrimeCon 2017. So that's right. It's taking place in Indianapolis. Hopefully some of our Real Crime Profile fans can make it out and come to a live podcast. And there's a great lineup of people appearing. Our brother Tim Clementi and I will be hosting CrimeCon. We will be uh, introducing all the different celebrities and speakers that will be there. And I think there's going to be some interesting people there because not only do we have Nancy Grace, but F. Lee Bailey and actually the prosecutor from the Making a Murder oh, case. Oh, yes, indeed. Mr. Kratz. Yes. Mr. Kratz. Yes. It'd be very interesting, very interesting to talk to him. I so yeah, so, so check out uh, the website www.crimecon.com and you'll see the whole schedule. And our listeners can get 20% off the top on any tickets by using the promo code REALCRIME20, REALCRIME, the number 20. On top of that, if you go as a group, they give you a further discount as well. So it's worth looking on our Twitter feed at Real Crime Profile without the E. And we can't wait to meet you and talk to you and actually do a live podcast right from CrimeCon 2017 live. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. 
These are definitely worst case, worst case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. Um, States Exhibit 67A shows the, um, the hog-tying fashion. Um, the, the hands were hog-tied um, to the feet behind the back. And this is a photograph um, showing that, the shoelaces. And that injury, um, you see, it's, it's typical of a, of a belt injury. You know, the belt has a little buckle, and that's what the, the buckle, that's that little um, one that goes back and forth, left and right. That's the, the base. One other significant injury that we haven't talked about yet, but there was some soft tissue damage, particularly in uh, one of the children, Chris Byers. And it's described over and over again uh, by law enforcement as, as he was castrated. Is... It's not an accurate description of what actually happened. Um, well, it was said that he was skinned and castrated, which, again, just paints such a different mm-hmm. picture of what really happened. When his body was found, the skin around the, the shaft and head of the penis was gone. And so um, that, there were a lot of theories about how that occurred and, and some medical testimony about that that was, as you said, quite confusing because it didn't seem to jive with what the evidence was. There were other pieces of testimony that also, when you're talking about the condition of the bodies, um, that are are not clear in the autopsy report, but yet I think the determinations that were made were, were just guesses on the part of these professionals. Um, I use that term loosely at this point just because I don't believe that they had the training necessary to actually make those determinations. And because of that, in this town this small, to have three young boys murdered and their bodies dumped in a stream, of course that's going to cause all sorts of fear and concern and and even hysteria. Uh, And I believe that People wanted to believe that this was done by some kind of monster or monster predators. And that is, um, based on everything that we've seen so far, um, just, it's just not supported. That I believe that they went with this hysteria and, and were looking for monsters. And it uh, can't be one of us. It has to be monsters from outside. And, of course, that um, then leads to people assuming that this is now a sex crime and that it's a sexually motivated crime. And actually, you know, what was recorded for Chris Byers was that the skin of the penis, scrotal sac and testes were missing with gaping defect, shaft of penis present, gaping defect surrounding... Uh, surrounded by multiple and extensive irregular punctuate gouging type injuries. Um, Some of the wounds showed hemorrhage and underlying soft tissue, others did not. In between the thighs were multiple areas of yellow abrasions with skin slippage. Medial aspect of left thigh showed a yellow abrasion. So, you know, again, because it doesn't list what he... Well, it says that he, Chris Byers, cause of death was bleeding out and skull fractures... Well, this is the only thing that is listed really in terms of a significant injury to, uh, for him to have bled out. Right. But of course, then you make the assumption that this happened, that it, sorry, that it didn't happen post-mortem. You make the assumption that it happened perimortem. Right, but the problem is that these bodies, these boys were discovered naked in a stream in the wild. <laughs> And 
what the FBI did uh, was similar to what's been done at the body farm, and that is we actually replicated situations um, where children were, their bodies were left in the wild. And we did it not by using actual children. We used it fetal pigs and young pigs um, because they have the the most closely associated skin to human beings. And so we use that to replicate what would happen in the conditions of uh, people, offenders leaving the body of a child out in the woods. And then we'd set up cameras and we watched how uh, the animal activity affected the bodies over time. And um, I think some of what you just described just now is incredibly consistent with what we saw with respect to animal activity as opposed to um, perimortem uh, criminal activity. Right, and it changes the whole face of the, the type of crime and the person that they think or persons that they think they're looking for. So it's really important, you know, to have somebody who can sequence the injuries um, and say, you know, what happened, or opine about what happened, when, yeah. how, where, because this is an overnight, you know, yeah. as you mentioned, there's a time gap between when they go missing and, and when they're found. So they're in the woods through the night. Right. And, I mean, the medical examiner should absolutely have been able to determine whether those were pre or post mortem. I mean, it's it, it's based on the the level of body response to those injuries. If somebody's dead, your body doesn't actually try to fix it. And so you'll see it in in its pristine state, the injury. Less blood. Yes. Or in fact, yeah, very little blood. Right. And bruising. Obviously in this situation, because these bodies were submerged, blood could be washed away. So they'd have to really look at the body's response to the injury. And if the child was still alive and not brain dead, then there should be some bodily response uh, to uh, such a pronounced type of injury. So um, I just don't know that this ME had the skill to do that, and that's really unfortunate. Uh, when I was in the behavioral analysis unit, we actually had a medical examiner that was on our board of advisors that would come in and advise us during the course of our roundtable sessions when we were looking at autopsy reports, and he was incredibly articulate about how to interpret uh, evidence that's found during an autopsy. And of course, many of the autopsies that we read were severely lacking in that kind of information. So what do you think about the fact that they were naked and they weren't killed, you know, they were clothed and then hogtied and submerged, but something happened that they were stripped before or after they were killed? Or what, what is the significance of that? Well, I do know that I believe one of the kid's shirts was used to help anchor him down with the help of this log. I remember uh, that as being part of the evidence that was presented. Um, so I don't know if they were all completely naked, but they certainly, their bodies appeared na- naked at the time when, when in the crime scene videos and, and pictures. But when generally when a body is found naked, there is an indicator that there is a sexual motive behind that crime. And just because there's no visible sexual assault doesn't mean that it wasn't a sexual motive. So that certainly would be one of the red flags towards a sexual motive, and we'd have to consider it. And that's, yes, what you would look at first of all. You know, a crime of this nature, three little boys... You know, it would tend to be there's a higher probability that this is a sexually motivated crime. So, you know, in terms of the actually just looking at the items of clothing recovered, three pairs of pants were recovered, three shirts, six shoes, one sock, one uh, one pair of underwear and one cap. So missing was still five socks and two pairs of underwear. So there's a question mark about, you know, was the area searched well enough or Do were they, they wash away down washed the away, carried away, taken away? There's lots of other possibilities that may well have happened. And this is all about clearing the ground from under your feet. 
of you know ensuring that you search the scene thoroughly, even when it's an outdoors um, or outside scene or even underwater scene, which mm-hmm. of course we've had experts on talking about right. some of the challenges with different types of scenes. And this was definitely a challenging scene, uh, you know, not just because it was late being discovered but because it was an isolated area where there could be and would be a lot of animal activity as well. But it can change the face um, and shape of the crime. And, of course, this community was now gripped by fear and lots of misinformation was being put into the public domain and um, rumours were being promulgated. And, of course, there was... Uh, there were a lot of community tensions and people getting very angry and wanting, you know, the offender or offenders brought to justice. So, again, looking at this crime scene being disposal site um, and potentially a primary crime scene, one of the things that is blatantly missing, especially when you have one kid who ostensibly bled to death, um, if that is an accurate assessment. Is exsanguination really the cause of death in that case? I don't know. Or did he bleed out post-mortem? I mean, simply by the fact that his, uh, that he had open wounds um, on his body and he was in a river that could con- constantly wash away um, blood. Obviously, when the, when the heart stops beating, it's not pumping blood through your veins and arteries anymore. So it would have to be that the, the gaping wound would be at the lowest part of the body, so it's basically just draining out. Um, but I don't know that that's even possible to determine at this point because I don't think that the bodies were undisturbed um, when, they were, when they were found. And uh, unfortunately, there's... There's no way to go back and recreate that. And the fact that they were moved. But certainly, you know, what was said about the in the autopsy report about the skull, uh, the injuries to the skull, is uh, that there were multiple fractures, two at the base of the skull. And, you know, of course, this is a very violent and brutal crime. Um, and the murder weapon, as far as I'm aware, was never found, as in, you know, what caused those mm. fractures to the skull? I don't think that that was ever clear. But, of course, in this first documentary, there's a lot of talk around a knife. So, again, you know, working out what really went on, it's just so important. It really does show how uh, different tangents and different rabbit holes and different conversations are being had that aren't relevant to the type of crime that's being committed. You know, Jim and Laura, so many listeners are very interested in the West Memphis Three case that we're covering. They really can't get enough of this topic. Yeah, it's a compelling case, and several documentaries and feature films have been made about it, and many books have been written about the subject. But you know what? There's so much out there, you can hardly find time to read it all, especially when I'm trying to research a case like this. But now there's a whole new way to enjoy books on your favorite topic. The great thing is you can listen anytime, anywhere on Audible. And right now, you can try it for free by texting the word AUDIBLE to the number 28325. If you're interested in hearing more about this case that's commonly known as the West Memphis Three, you can go to audible.com slash real crime and get this book for free called Devil's Knot, the true story of the West Memphis Three. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from leading audiobook publishers broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. And the great thing is membership includes one free audiobook a month, plus exclusive sales, 30% off regularly priced audiobooks. And unlike other streaming services, with Audible you own your books, which for me is great because I love to keep going back and forth and looking at my references. Um, So it's a fantastic resource to refer to time and time again. So get a free trial membership now by texting the word AUDIBLE. A-U-D-I-B-L-E to the number 28325. Again, text AUDIBLE to 28325. To me, this place as I stand is like hell on earth because I know that three babies were killed right out here where I stand. One of the things that stood out to me during the 
first documentary was The Behavior of John Mark Byers. Uh, he's the stepfather of Christopher Byers, and he was very uh, enamored of being on camera and attention. He really appeared to me to be a spotlight whore, and he wanted to get and take every opportunity to get in front of the cameras and be as outrageous as he possibly could. I know at one point he said, I know my stepson was possibly laid on that bank. I know he was choked. And then he goes on to say a whole bunch of other things that we know he wasn't. <laughs> and so um, he's obviously uh, either making things up or going by rumor and innuendo and but taking the opportunity to be very graphic um, on camera. And uh, I think, obviously, the man has some issues. And uh, he, he does not um, shy away from being overly dramatic. What did you think about him, Laura? He was certainly an interesting character and, you know, the introduction to him and just showing him in two very different lights of sort of the God-fearing element, which we should probably talk about, you know, that particular area, the amount of churches there are and obviously there's scenes of them in church of him singing and coming across as this, you know, holier, holier than, than thou. thou. Mm -hmm. And then the next minute you see him, you know, shooting the pumpkin and saying exactly what he wants to do. Um, to those individuals who he believes are responsible for the the murders, and you know, then at the crime scene, at the you know, I kind of called it the ranting and raving, um, and saying all these things that he is now pushing as sort of fact of skinning them, mutilating them, all these things that didn't happen. Um, but he seems very upfront and overt about it. You know, there is no. Uh, hidden part I felt from the start with him and certainly st stands out as somebody that you would want to question and you would want to absolutely understand where he was at what time, how much time you know he spent with the children, him being the stepfather to Chris and of course that, that all comes out. But I think just before his sort of real introduction about who he is, a standout interview for me was Pamela Hobbs, the mother yes, of Stevie yes, yes. Branch, which I found very curious so this is all going to get very confusing if you haven't watched the documentary because we're going to be talking about these three little boys and their and their different parents. But so I just want to go back one, just one moment to talk about John Mark Byers, just to know that he's a big guy, a big lumbering guy, kind of balding with long hippie hair in the back, and is got quite a swagger. And as Lauren Jim said, is very fire and brimstone, over the top, dramatic. And I tried to withhold my opinion about him to try to stay neutral, you know, because people handle grief in different ways. But he was definitely the she protests too much kind of a person, kind of <clears throat> over the top with it. He doth protest. He doth, yes, I should know this. because yes. And of course, he's a stepfather as well, which right. was an instant question mark for me, sure. knowing what we know, as right. we've said. But then we move on to the to Pam Hobbs. So go, we should describe her. She's rail thin. Right. And kind of curly, perm permed blonde hair. And her behavior was very odd to me in this yeah. part of the documentary. And that's why it's interesting in the doc, you kind of see behind the cameras. So you see people being interviewed, um, you know, as they're being interviewed. So it's sort of a fly on the wall before, before the yes, setup. Right. And, and so you get to see these little kind of nuanced things right. and glimpses of someone. But and I this, thought you're talking about her behavior before they started rolling uh, officially, or what are you talking she's about? She's being interviewed just on not a playing long, field. On a playing field, not long after the murders. And she's either on something or she's had a break. She's like giggling and kind of loosey-goosey with her body. And this idiot reporter is is just asking her crazy these... questions. Right, but I think, I think you're right. I think she may have been on something. But I also think there's a certain giddiness when somebody from – you know, HBO sticks a camera in your her face. Local reporter and... saying, "Have you all ever considered suicide?" It's like, are you? Do you blame fucking yourself? Kidding me? And... Yeah, I mean, so the questions idiot. were just absolutely horrific. I mean, mm. in terms of you know what the media should and shouldn't ask. Right. That's definitely not something you should ask uh, a mother whose son is missing. That does she blame herself and has she thought of suicide? But I, I've certainly seen that nervousness. Uh, or that kind of laughter, inappropriate laughter before. 
Um, and it comes down to normally nervousness and, you know, I'd say the cameras being there. But I also looked at her baseline just across the rest of the, the filming and I did find it curious because she suddenly was getting her hair done and her makeup done and she looked very different. And there were parts where I felt she, along with others, were sort of performing for the cameras and it felt Absolutely. very uncomfortable. And I think that went all the way through into the trial. And I think that it's, there are, you know, they've actually determined in physics that, that when you actually view an event, when you look at an event, it actually changes the event. It actually physically affects the event. Mm. And I think that's the same when you, when you film an event. When you film an event, it actually does. It creates um, people want to put forth their best image rather than necessarily the truth. And I don't think you get, like people think, well, there's a, the camera is just recording what happens. But it's not like that at all. I mean, there's producers, there's sound guys, there's all sorts of lighting, there's all sorts of stuff that's going on. And it's a distraction, and it doesn't necessarily accurately represent what's going on. I think in the OJ trial, the, the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and, and Ron Goldman, that the cameras in the courtroom affected the prosecution team as much as it affected the defense team, and as much as the defense team played up to the cameras. Um, and I think they used, especially Johnny Cochran, used the cameras in the courtroom and then courthouse press conferences to manipulate the community, to ma manipulate the country, to put pressure on the judge. And it all was sort of a comprehensive effort to make sure that justice was not served. I think that there is a, there is a, a real good argument not to have cameras stuck in the faces of witnesses in the in the course of such an event and in the course of such an investigation or trial. And I think that it in this case, that's what you were responding to. I think that she, uh, the mother, was was probably, you know, on some kind of controlled substance and that she also was reacting to the the very, you know, sort of almost exhilarating presence of cameras in her face. And certainly we know that uh, John Mark Beyer was as well. Yes, and it's certainly not a, a judgment on them or a damning judgment, right. but it's an right. observation, isn't it? And that's, you know, we're looking at material and some of it, this is prima facie, as it's happening, it's being recorded. So, you know, that's what we're going on, but it's certainly not, um, you know, a judgment to cast dispersions. They're just points of interest and I think certainly, you know, that little element of her, you know, saying, well, I was at work, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be blamed. Actually, I just put a little marker down of what was going on in their household, you know, who, who was in her household at, at that time? What mm -hmm. were the relationships like with Stevie? Because I felt that there was something interesting about her, that she may have known some other things that she doesn't know what went on, but there are some historical things right. that I think would be very interesting to ask questions about in terms of the victimology and the dynamics within the household. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's a, a good, insightful question to ask. Why would she volunteer that kind of information? What, it was, what was it that uh, caused her to want to sort of justify her behavior and, and put kind of an alibi right. out there? Because if Stevie wasn't in her care, then whose care was he in? And what does she know about that person or where he was meant to be? But obviously, with all families, there's always that part that they go through. Could I have done something differently? Should I have done something differently? If only I had been there at X, then why wouldn't it have happened? And I hear that, sadly, from bereaved families all of the time. They go through that narrative and turn it over time and time again. Just to say a word about Michael Moore's parents, um, they seem the most sort of, how would you describe them, Laura? Not modest, but just very quiet, um, not really making, drawing a lot of attention to themselves in the interviews that I saw. It's Todd and Dana Moore, and Todd is sort of like a, a burly, kind short and burly kind of a dad, and, and Dana has this long red flowing hair, lots of freckles, and they just... They're just quietly suffering, it looked like, through this whole thing. You know, they weren't, some of the parents were really vocal, you know, outside the courthouse and screaming at 
um, the defendants and all of this, and they just seemed very contained in their grief. Which they had a lot of dignity. Yeah. I mean, dignity and humility, but devastated, you know, and absolutely, um, you know, torn apart by what happened. Mm. But everyone deals with it differently, and some, right. you know, go into themselves and actually sort of close the, the the sort of keep the family very close and don't express things outwardly. You know, and others, as as we saw, were courting the cameras and wanting to express things very overtly. Um, and it really does, you know, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncomfortable having cameras on people at their, their worst times when their lives are falling apart and they've got a camera, you know, thrust in their face. And for introverts or pri- people who want to deal with it privately, that, that cannot feel very comfortable. Right. Yeah, and I think that over the course of these documentaries, I think they maintain that same sort of... Um, reserved composure in their grief, um, and their grief was very palpable. And this is a catastrophic time, and I also just want to mention, you know, the the other siblings, because these were all households that had a, another child, and when something horrific and catastrophic like this happens, people always tend to forget about the, you know, surviving child in inverted commas, and, you know, sometimes they can suffer from survivor's guilt. There's all sorts of things that can happen psychologically for them, you know, being terrified, not being able to sleep, having nightmares, you know. And so they go on their own journey, too. But they're the ones that tend to be forgotten about whilst, uh, you know, the kind of the the attention is is taken and unfolded in, in the grief of the, the parents. So I always think about them and certainly families that I've interviewed where, the other children, uh, you know, don't necessarily get the care and attention that, that they deserve, but they have their own psychological battles and, and, and journey to go on as well. And, of course, they weren't... I think one of them was recorded in, in the documentaries, and I think that was a very interesting interview. Mm-hmm. So, of course, this heinous crime and situation has unfolded, and the families are all very vocal about it, and, of course, it's in the media... And in that small community, there's this real sense of anger and, um, you know, people are genuinely terrified, but they're angry and they want the police and they want law enforcement to um, arrest somebody. They want somebody to be held responsible for what happened. I think that played a very key role, that kind of community tension, anger, fear, this kind of melting pot that put a huge amount of of pressure on the local law enforcement. Absolutely. So... They needed to find somebody quick to blame for these crimes. And that's where we'll pick it up in the next episode of Real Crime Profile. Thanks for listening. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family, and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.